Okay, uh, Sergeant Biondo, you can start with the opening. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Gavilan. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair to the Committee on Governmental Operations. I want us to start off by thanking the members of the committee joining us today. Majority Leader Lori Combo, Council Member Perkins, and Council Member Kalos. Today, the committee will be hearing one piece of legislation that will help chart a course for the restarting of our city's government and the potential return of hundreds of thousands of city employees and uh, to in person workplaces. Introduction number nine, 1950 sponsored by Majority Leader and Council Member Lori Combo will require the mayor to designate a city restart officer for the purpose of recommending both citywide and agency specific policies and protocols to promote the safe reopening and operations of city agencies in response to COVID-19 in coordination with the city's public health experts at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. This bill will also require city agencies to develop and publish their own policies and protocols to be reviewed by the city restart officers for the purpose of promoting compliance with applicable laws and regulations and for coordinating the citywide effort to mitigate the ongoing public health risk posed by COVID-19. In a moment, we will hear from our majority leader about the details of her legislation. So for now, I will simply say, COVID-19 is deadly, is deadly serious. We must take every caution as we begin planning a return to working in office person. The risk to human lives should not be downplayed for the sake of bureaucratic efficiency. I think, I think we as a city, as, as a city government, have learned a lot over the last three months about the resiliency and flexibility of our city's workforce. We have also learned about the urgent infrastructural needs of our city must address in order to make work from home a viable possibility for all non-essential city employees. As we plan a return, even partial, we must take the advice of public health experts into account. I look forward to hearing from the administration today as we, as as well as our local unions and other stakeholders, about the ways in which our city can make public health and workplace safety a priority while beginning to reopen our government. I want to thank our majority leader, Council Member Lori Combo, for introducing this piece of legislation. I also want to give a special thanks to our committee staff. They do such a wonderful work. CJ Murray, Emily Forjong, Elizabeth Kong, Sebastian Bacci, and the many central staff working behind the scenes to make this remote hearing operate smoothly like no other municipality. I also want to thank my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for making this hearing possible. I would like now to invite Majority Leader Combo, sponsor of the intro 1950, the bill we are hearing today to give a statement. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Can you hear me? Chair Cabrera? We can hear Chair. you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Cabrera, I wanna thank you so much for hosting this uh, particular hearing. Um, I know that this is also particularly important to you because your family has been uh, intimately touched with COVID-19, and I'm so glad that they are recovering um, and that you and your family are healthy and safe at this time. I wanna thank everyone that's uh, on the call today 
uh, for this particular hearing, because all over the country, we are hearing the numbers rise in terms of the amount of COVID cases that are being reported. We certainly do not want to have a second wave of COVID-19, which would be devastating um, to our nation and to our city. So it's so important that we put the proper precautions in place um, and make sure that we open New York City safely. And so often New York City continues to be and remains the center of what happens in the rest of the country and the rest of the world. People certainly look to us towards uh, issues around guidance, best practices, and we wanna make sure that here in New York City, we are doing it right. And this particular legislation will allow us to do just that. New York City operates one of the biggest bureaucracies in the world, it's city government. The city employs over 300,000 people, more than any other city in the United States and even some state governments. Throughout COVID-19, our city agencies quickly adapted to the changes that were necessary to ensure New York's health and safety. However, we are still experiencing devastating loss. As of yesterday, there were just over 207,000 confirmed cases of the coronavirus. As a result, many New Yorkers are excited but apprehensive about opening, and rightfully so. We're grateful of the work that agencies are doing to reopen safely. All we need now is a restart officer to make sure that the city is relaying its best practices to every New Yorker. As I often say, it takes a village. And that's exactly what we're doing here today. We wanna make sure that we are putting forth the best practices to make sure that New York City opens safely and that people that are coming back to work our workforce, who are moms, dads, grandmothers, grandfathers, sisters, uncles, uh, nieces and nephews, that people are coming back to their homes safe, providing all of the necessary elements to do that. I want to thank on my team, uh, Jason Herr, my legislative director. I want to thank Alicia Mercedes, as well as uh, my chief of staff, staff, Tasha Young, and all that worked so hard to get us to this point. And again, I wanna thank you, Fernando Cabrera. You have been a great partner and friend through this whole process. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Majority Leader, and thank you for your friendship as well and uh, for caring. You always have a big heart uh, regarding those, specific, specifically those who are hurting uh, in our society. I, I also want to uh, uh, recognize we've been joined also by Council Member Yeager. So good to see you, Council Member. And with that, I want to now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council CJ Murray, to go over some procedural items. Our moderator is muted. Can you hear me? Yes, now loud and clear. Thank you. I'm CJ Murray, counsel to the Governmental Operations Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, none to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be Department of Citywide Administrative Services Commissioner Lisette Camillo. In addition, the following representatives will be available to answer questions. From DCAS, Executive Deputy Commissioners Quentin Haynes and Don Pinnock. From the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Deputy Commissioner Corinna Schiff. And from the Office of Labor Relations, First Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel, Steve Banks. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raised hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelist to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. 
Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Camillo, Executive Deputy Commissioner Haynes, Executive Deputy Commissioner Pinnock, Deputy Commissioner Schiff, and First Deputy Commissioner Banks, please raise your right hands. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Camillo? I do. Executive Deputy Commissioner Haynes? I do. Executive Deputy Commissioner Pinnock? I do. Deputy Commissioner Schiff? Yes. First Deputy Commissioner Banks? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Camillo, you may begin your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Cabrera, members of the Committee on Governmental Operations and Majority Leader Councilmember Cumbo. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Today, I'm joined by representatives from the Office of Labor Relations and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, two agencies that have been critical partners with DCAS throughout the pandemic and have helped shape city workforce policies in response to this public health emergency. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken an enormous toll on the people of New York City and communities all over the world. This burden has not been evenly distributed and black and brown New Yorkers have been disproportionately harmed. From this terrible loss of human life to the economic pain felt by millions of our neighbors, the reality we live in today is very different from anything we could have imagined just a few short months ago. To meet this unprecedented challenge, the city has had to marshal its resources and rethink all aspects of government operations. By implementing telework policies, facilitating the widespread use of face coverings, promoting healthy hand hygiene, instituting social distancing and other health and safety precautions, we've kept city government functioning while protecting our workforce. We are working diligently to ensure we continue to do so. Today, despite enormous progress, there continues to be community transmission of COVID-19 in New York City. Slowing the spread of coronavirus and preventing a new wave of cases requires that all New Yorkers, including city employees, maintain what the health department calls the core four. Staying home when sick, wearing face coverings, practicing healthy hand hygiene, and staying six feet apart. These four fundamental practices also guide the city's plan to return to the workplace and expand operations. For those employees who do not have to physically be at work, this means ongoing telecommuting, which helps keep them safe and reduces density on public transit and at work sites for those that must return to the workplace. For employees who work out in neighborhoods, it requires reimagining certain protocols. And for those who must work in the office, it means reconfiguring our space, increasing the frequency of cleaning and disinfection, and expanding communication. As city employees adjust to a new normal, it will include daily health screenings and reinforcing habits designed to keep ourselves and others safe. As we know from the experience of the last several months, our understanding of this disease, of this disease is changing rapidly and recommendations will evolve. We will likewise adjust plans when warranted by the facts. Planning for a return to the workplace is ongoing and we are working collaboratively across city agencies to examine best practices and develop policies that protect the health and safety of city employees. We intend to maintain the steady state, teleworking for those who do not need to be at a work site and reevaluating as necessary based on the trajectory of the virus. We acknowledge that there are staff who cannot perform their required tasks from home and we are reviewing mandates and recommendations from New York State and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to ensure a return to the workplace is grounded in a health and safety approach. Based on this work, the administration is developing formal guidance and protocols that will be issued to all agencies before any return to the office occurs. The administration has approached this guidance with four categories in mind, preparing buildings, preparing workspaces, preparing the workforce and communication. Preparing buildings includes inspecting and preparing building systems, entrances, and common areas. It includes establishing and implementing new building policies and practices to control access, promoting social distancing, and maintaining building health. Preparing the workspace is a closely related category 
includes establishing and implementing policies and protocols for promoting social distancing through a strategic approach to the reconfiguration and use of workspaces. Preparing the workforce means developing and implementing policies and practices relating to the return of staff, which staff will return, how staff will return, policies with respect to working remotely, and steps to protect employee health and well being. Also, communication will be key in tying all of these categories together. City employees need to understand the steps their agencies have taken to protect their safety and ensure an orderly process for returning to work. It's important that agencies are transparent, accessible, and make extra efforts to answer questions and address challenges through two-way communication. This administration is taking a holistic approach to the planning and execution of a process for returning employees to work sites. And we want to make sure this process is orderly and safe above all else. The city cannot effectively serve its constituents unless its workforce is safe, healthy, and equipped for success. This has been a collaborative effort between the mayor's office and city agencies, and no single individual has been at the helm of these efforts. We welcome the city council's input and believe that intro 1950 supports the administration's goal of creating a safe and healthy workplace for city agencies across, I'm sorry, for city employees across every agency. We look forward to further dialogue with the city council on this very important matter. There will be more to say as guidelines are formalized, but I'm happy to take questions about the categories of actions and information that may be included in the city's guidance to agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Camilo. Next, we will hear questions from Chair Cabrera, followed by Majority Leader Cumbo. Possible during this question and answer period. Chair Cabrera, please begin. Thank you so much, uh, commissioners. Good to see you again. I know uh, you have in the last few months to manage to store a uh, tremendous amount of, of work and resetting systems and structures throughout uh, ECAS and working with all the agencies. So I want to personally thank you uh, for all the work that you're doing. I know uh, you have work. Uh, you, you're still in overdrive right now, especially now that we're getting ready uh, to enter phase two. Uh, and so with that, I, I want to just jump into a few questions. Uh, how many city employees have started working from home? How many you anticipate will start working from home uh, as the phases, as we enter into new uh, phases? So um, the... The, my partner at OLR uh, can talk about specific numbers, but generally about two thirds of the city's workforce, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, was able to transition it for, to a work from home uh, uh, status. Uh, in terms of how many will be returning and when, that's not something that I can answer right now, that's too early to tell as of yet. Agencies are, um, you know, have to start the analysis of really looking at their workforce and looking at how we're going to bring back any services that have been offline uh, since the start of the uh, public health emergency um, and phasing in, making decisions on how to phasing, how to phase in their workforce. So that work uh, will, you know, is, is, is starting. Um, we, are, we are producing guidance uh, to give to agencies uh, as they start doing a deeper dive into their operations to plan for that return. So uh, it's too soon to give actual numbers right now, um, but as that work um, and analysis continues and a, and a, and a plan is, is finalized, um, we won't be able to give those um, numbers. So, so let me uh, just be a little bit more detailed. In phase one, did you have uh, city workers come back the work site? Under phase one, I think that there were some agencies that might have brought back um, some level of, of employees that tied directly to the industries that were coming back online. So if, for example, with construction uh, reopening, uh, you might have employees at the Department of Buildings who now had work sites to go inspect. Um, those were very, you know, limited examples since it was a limited opening. 
uh, and that every agency would undertake that uh, analysis and make that determination on their own. So you have phase two uh, coming on Monday, I believe. Uh, and you have not received from agencies this curious uh, their plans and numbers of amount of workers that are coming back. I mean, it's Tuesday already and uh, Monday's coming up. Do you have any idea for phase two? No, not globally. I think that the um, agencies are looking at their overall operations and make, and starting to, to analyze how they're going to bring back their employees and how many. We, we don't have finalized plans or um, uh, Phase two. finalized numbers as of yet. Uh, so when are they going to have that by since we're talking about six days from now? I think that for we're, we're finalizing the guidance now and that should be ready in the next couple of days to provide to agencies once they have that framework to really put together a formalized plan we we think that in the next couple of weeks we'll start getting some additional information from agencies uh, as to what they're thinking and how they're approaching a phased in a phased approach to returning to the office so which agencies do you anticipate the pay uh, for Monday having the largest amount of the workforce return back. Did you know that? At this now? point, at this point, as I mentioned, the Department of Buildings um, okay. we know will be um, uh, will are slowly starting to um, uh, perhaps bring on their their workforce. Although I, my understanding is that they they had a number of their employees uh, work. Uh, or be active. So I, I don't know that they have that much um, additional staff coming back to the office, but I know that con because construction is open, um, you know, they're certainly more active. Uh, does the city uh, envision uh, any savings in the future, such as any uh, for city office space or any other type of savings that we could get creative with? So I think it's a it's a little too soon to to tell at this point because we are still working on how that phased in approach is going to work. We're not sure whether or not there's going to be underutilized space because remember when workers come back, we have to ensure that they're socially distant uh, with each other. So that analysis has has to be finalized uh, before you know we can uh, look to see what under, underutilized space we have. But, you know, that process will be ongoing and, you know, conversations will continue to happen. And obviously, you know, given all that's going on, we want to make sure that we're, we're thoughtful in our approach um, and continuing the analysis. So what do you think that you will be able to make that analysis? When you feel, when do you think you'll feel comfortable that we will be in a place that we could say, okay, we can make this analysis? I, I wish I could give you a time frame um, because we're still at the beginning of the planning stages to phase in, and at, until we're actively in living out the plan and seeing how things shake out, um, you know, we've never done this before, right? This is a a very a new thing for all of us, and so we, I would rather be conservative in the approach and really be. You know, let's let's deal with the with the first with with this issue of you know making sure that our our people are safe, that we're providing um, you know a safe workplace um, uh, before we um, you know get on to other um, you know goals. But you know we're like I said, it's an ongoing process, and we're certainly going to uh, look under every rock. Uh, I'm just going to ask one last question here. Um... Pursuant to intro 1950, sponsored by my colleague, Majority Leader Convo, who would the administration designate to act as the chief restart officer? And what is their current title, agency, and role? And please describe their qualifications and work in this area of the department. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. So my question is, uh, you want me to start from the beginning? Sorry, yes. Okay, it's okay, it's all good. This is what we do. Pursuing 
to an intro 1950. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, sponsored by Majority Leader Com. officer, what is their current title, agency and role, and please describe their qualification and work in this, in this area up to this point. So I think that we, as I mentioned in my um, uh, opening statement, there's not been one entity that has, uh, you know, ownership over this exercise. It really has been a partnership across multiple agencies and across and with the mayor's office. Um, so that's something that I think we would like to discuss uh, and continue um, um, exploring um, because it it deals with health, it deals with you know agency operations. Every agency is very different and has specific needs that only the commissioner really has has the ability to make determinations about and has the expertise to make decisions about. What, what the needs for their agencies are. So um, it's not clear to me uh, that there's an obvious uh, you know, person. So I think because it is a shared, it's been a shared exercise with a number of different agencies, um, you know, it's something that you know, we would be um, uh, open you know, to, to, to talk about and explore because it's not, there's not an obvious uh, person sitting in the city. So Commissioner, uh, that, that, that dialogue, uh, it's, uh, that I think is a good time to pass it on then to a majority leader uh, combo, because I'm sure she's going to want to have that level of dialogue. But let me also recognize that we've been joined by council member myself. So with that, uh, let me pass it on to my colleague. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Uh, and thank you so much, Commissioner, for your testimony today. I have quite a few questions around uh, some of the follow-up questions that Councilmember Cabrera brought up. But I first want to start off by asking, um, how does your agency and the administration feel about Intro 1950? What are your thoughts on it more specifically? Do you think it's a good thoughtful process uh, for agencies to, 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 to plan out their uh, return to the office functions. And, and that's what we've been uh, working on. Uh, at, you know, we're putting together a framework and guidance for agencies to use in, in, in thinking through how to approach the return to work, right? So we focus on the, the buildings, the, 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 the workspaces, the, the policies that have to be, um, you know, uh, looked at for, for the workforce. And, and frankly, I mean, what we want is to ensure the health and safety of our workforce. And that's, that's clear in the goal of the, of the intro. And that's definitely what's driving our work uh, so far with the, with the guidance. Do you think that the interagency approach, um, that there is capacity and there is expertise amongst the interagencies to do this work as it currently exists? Or do you think that an officer and or an office rather um, would be more ideal in terms of coordinating all of the interagencies, but also bringing in people that have the level of expertise that's necessary to do this? Have people with that level of expertise um, been brought in or are you uh, utilizing existing staff? We have been working across the agencies that have the expertise uh, to inform the, the guidance. So the answer is that there is expertise across the city to do this. And I think that as agencies uh, plan to bring that stuff back online, um, you know, every agency has is different. Every agency has a different uh, operations, different mm -hmm. um, uh, needs different, you know, size, you know, so I think that um, it's not, it can't be a, a cookie cutter approach. Um, right. It has to be a very 
thoughtful um, exercise that agencies are, should re really, are, the agencies have their, their own expertise on how they, they need to operate and function. And they're the best experts to make the determination and decisions on, on how to bring things on in a, in a phased way. Uh, so, um, you know, utilizing the guidance that, you know, lives across the city in terms of the things that are driving the health and safety approach, like uh, the health department uh, weighing in and um, advising us on uh, what the proper practices are with respect to, you know, uh, how to prevent the spread, uh, the building folks, uh, mm -hmm. will we'll have um, uh, expertise to, to weigh in on as well. So we, we, we have the expertise that live across the agency. But let me ask you this question, but, but what you're describing essentially means that there's no particular place where you could say the buck stops here. So it's kind of a shared approach and agencies talk with other agencies and then it seems like someone in that agency kind of determines that this is the best way but that it doesn't seem like there's a, these are the guidelines and the protocols that have to be established. And it's, it appears as if there's not a go-to um, in terms of a, a buck stops here. Is that accurate? No. So the, the guidance that I've spoken about that uh, in partnership with other agencies like the Department of Health, like the Depart like, uh, Office of Labor Relations, the Law Department and, and DCAS, we've put together, we're putting together um, uh, the, the uh, framework to approach the return. And it includes uh, best practices from experts, not only in the city, but throughout the, the state and country. So we want to make sure that, for example, all of our guidance will be consistent with the state's guidance and the CDC's guidance, so that all of those um, substantive things that agencies have to think about and consider and implement are are must be done. So there are things in our guidance that are requirements, um, mm -hmm. like screening employees uh, uh, upon entry. So that's something that is not a suggestion, but a requirement. And that was developed by the Department of Health. They developed a tool, a screening tool that will be incorporated and shared with every city agency. So that's just one example of, of, of a substantive requirement that our guidance sets forth. So ultimately, um, the, the guidance will provide very, you know, specific requirements, best practices and recommendations for agencies to review and implement depending on what their operations require, what their space looks like, what their workforce uh, does. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's not mm -hmm. a suggestions, but it's, it's, it's very, um, uh, a very thorough uh, and thoughtful approach to the planning. Let me ask you. So let's say different agencies, they get there. Let's look at city council. Let's use that for an example. My office. Is there something or someone in place that's going to come in to make sure that I'm being an effective manager and leader? So for example, if there are rules about desk space need to be six feet apart, there needs to be hand sanitizer at the door, there needs to be face masks worn, there can only be occupancy by so many people in this particular office. Is there a task force, if you will, that's going to be looking to see implemented and put into place? Are you asking about like an enforcement? Correct. Kind of similar to function? what the restaurants have. So the restaurants have that element where people come in, they check to see if there are violations, if they're you know, rats and rodents or, you know, right. egresses so, are being respected, that sort of thing. So that's, that's, an inf that's, that's an enforcement function. And I think if you're referring to what the restaurants um, uh, have to abide by, you know, there's, a, there's a, an enforcement infrastructure which agencies that have that ability and authority under, you know, their statutes to, to do. Um, we do not have an enforcement uh, part of the of our guidance um my unless i mean the does the does the introduction have the enforcement function i don't believe it did either um because i think that what's important through as we think through the i'm looking for new legislative ideas <laughs> <laughs> so um i think that you know ultimately i don't the, the thing that 
is certain across the agencies, right? Is that everyone is looking to do what is most secure and safe for its workforce. So I don't think that anyone will want to gamble, take a gamble on the health and safety of their workforce. And I think that the guidance that we have been putting together incorporates uh, requirements, um, just like the, you know, to, to align itself with what the state and federal government are, are advising um, and uh, additional recommendations from experts in the field to consider and apply to every unique circumstances. And I think that with that information, all of those resources, that those are all the tools that uh, agency heads will, you know, will, will be able to use to, to develop a thoughtful approach to the return to the office. I mean, I think it is going to be critical to have an office of sorts that's able to work with the agencies in terms of not only enforcement, but also guidance in the sense of there's gonna be some handholding. So for example, I mean, this is my greatest fear as well. Let's say, because we're all, we're all waiting with bated breath in terms of when our offices are gonna reopen. And what I can see, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of time when we're gonna know when that's gonna be and when it happens. So let's say you say next Friday, your office opens. And then I'll say, oh, we don't have any hand sanitizer. Hey, send one of the interns with 20 bucks to go get some hand sanitizer for the office and we'll just squirt everybody with some hand sanitizer when, it, when they come in the office. Like my fear is that that could actually happen in terms of how much preparation and lead time, how much should we start ordering like hand sanitizers and bulk for our, for our offices the same way we do with many other supplies and things like that? Like, how do we, how do we get prepared for the, the, the real deal of reopening our offices again? So I think, and I take, offices. so I, I think it's um, important to note that the, the plans that agencies would be be putting together after receiving the guidance will literally be a checklist of the things that they are going to do in order to prepare to receive into the office. And that won't, that action won't happen until those plans are complete with enough lead time in order to adequately prepare. So, you know, we're not going to, um, do a hairpin turn and say, all right, Monday, you're back in, go for it. Um, you know, this, like I said, it's a measured and thoughtful uh, approach to not only putting together the plan, but phasing it in and, um, you know, making decisions on who, when, and where uh, are going to come back. So it's not a giant wave, but, um, and depending on the agencies and what their needs are, um, you know, it's an exercise of, 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 of planning and making sure that they're ready to execute before they actually execute. I also want to add, I think it would be responsible once the offices are open very quickly that all city employees um, go through a training the same way that we go for sexual harassment training and other forms of training so that people can know how to responsibly function and coexist in their prospective offices. So I think that training is going to be critical and very important to educating people about how to work differently and the realities of the transmission. My other question goes into um, what, what countries are you all working hand to hand with to understand best practices and to understand what have been the um, forward steps and backward steps that other countries rather who are more advanced because they've gone through this with maybe a three to four month lead time over us, um, how they are faring in um, their restart. So I think I'm gonna to toss that over to my colleague uh, from the health department. Sure, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Corinne Schiff, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health at the health department. And um, it's, it's an important question and um, as part of the health department's ongoing response to the public health emergency, we've got 
multiple people whose whose job it is to do exactly what you said, to be they are our principal scientific advisors and they are monitoring uh, what's happening around the world and they're monitoring the scientific literature of all sorts. And all of that goes into the guidance that we developed that we have been sharing with DCAS um, and that we share with New Yorkers on our, on our website. So that is very much a part of um, of how we have been um, managing throughout the public health emergency. And as you know, and as we all have, have seen, this is evolving as we around the world learn about this virus and how to respond. And that's why our, uh, our guidance, uh, just like the guidance from the state and from the CDC has continued to change, our guidance has continued to change as well as we monitor uh, the, it, what's happening in practice um, in other jurisdictions and the scientific literature. Can you give me an example of a country that you're working with and, and an example of something that we've learned as a result of their best practices? Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example um, from, from this morning um, that our principal scientific advisor uh, reported out to us that he is um, monitoring. I'm sure everyone um, has seen that, um, that in Beijing there are, um, there are some cases um, that they are monitoring there and that they are uh, doing um, uh, investigations around a, a market in an area where they have uh, monitored uh, contacts for people who become ill. And so we're tracking uh, closely what they are learning there. Um, and we'll, we'll see what, the, what those results are and we'll take lessons learned um, from that into, um, into our guidance. Mm -hmm. Um. I was hoping to get more out of that answer in terms of some of the things that we could take back to our own offices, but I'm sure my colleagues will be able to dig um, deeper into that. I'm just going to close with this one question and give my colleagues an opportunity to ask questions. Um, how has the administration engaged unions in discussions on how to proceed with sending personnel back to work? Have those conversations began in terms of working with our different labor unions um, and sharing best practices with them um, and how that will be handled? So I think that uh, the representative from OLR can, uh, can be able to answer that better than I can. Okay. Steve? Yep. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Camillo. And uh, yeah, so uh, OLR, we've been in constant contact with our uh, municipal unions and you know the, the city as an employer is in a little bit of a different position when you talk about phase one phase two etc because um, uh, Lizette appropriately mentioned that we've had many of our employees uh, working from home since late March but we've, we've also had a cohort of employees police officers EMTs DEP employees parks employees who have continued to work right so um, we've had a segment of our workforce who we've been able to refine our protocols and practices <laughs> rules and regulations as they can have continued to work in March, April, May, and June. Um, but then we're in constant contact and, you know, District Council 37 is probably the main union that would be affected by sort of a return to the office um, with office-based staff. And, uh, you know, Commissioner Campion and myself and the other, all our negotiators are in daily, at least daily contact with our colleagues at DC 37. And some of the issues that Lizette had mentioned about preparing the, uh, the workplaces and the HVAC systems and the, um, ensuring that cubicles are six feet apart. Those are conversations that we've already been having, um, certainly with DC 37 as the citywide civilian union. Um, and we've gotten questions from other groups as well. You know, over these past several months, uh, different agencies have designated different groups of employees as essential or non-essential. And we've, you know, we've worked through that, uh, worked through those issues with our labor partners, obviously, you know, there's there hasn't been always area, areas of complete agreement, but we've been able, able to work through those issues together. Okay, I'm going to turn it back to the chair uh, for our colleagues to ask questions. Thank you, Majority Leader Combo. I will now ca call on council members and they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelist. The Sergeant at Arms will keep
questions. Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to thank uh, uh, Majority Leader for the you know, in depth question. Uh, for uh, Department of Health Deputy Commissioner, uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, just with one question. Is there any more details to the question that she asked regarding when we return back to our offices? I, I, I saw your motion like you wanted to say more. Uh, is there anything else uh, that you could uh, enlighten us with, give us insight? Uh, no, I must have made, given an expression that, <laughs> that suggested I had something to add. No, I, I, I think, uh, you know, I agree with, with everything that uh, the commissioner has said. Is there anything happening right now that worries you? Uh, anything regarding uh, going into phase two, then hopefully phase three and phase four that we don't have in place that we should uh, in order to avoid uh, COVID-19 becoming uh, an increasing threat? <clears throat> Um, so I, I, I think you, you mentioned a uh, start date for phase two, you know, I've, I've, uh, it's been a busy day, so I may have missed some news. I, I don't, I don't know that we've gotten a start date um, for phase two. Um, uh, and I think, you know, what's, what's really important is, um, is what uh, we call the core four. You heard about that in Commissioner Camillo's uh, testimony, that's staying home when you're sick, wearing your face covering, staying six feet away. Uh, from other people and practicing healthy hand hygiene. So washing those hands and using hand sanitizer. And um, we need New Yorkers to adopt all of those practices into our daily living. Those need to become our habits for the next many, many, many months. We are, we are all in this together. Uh, my actions affect you, your actions affect me. I think that the point about communication that is a key part of DCAS's thinking and how they are guiding the agencies to reopen is critical. Employees will need to know how to implement um, the core four, how those will be implemented in their offices. Agency leaders will need to, to be able to express that to, to their employees. And that's really, that's what this is about. And um, it is these four sort of simple measures, but how you implement them is all in the details of the different work sites as, you, as you've as you been hearing um, in the testimony. And that's why it has to be left up to each agency to figure out how to implement in their workspace. It'll be, you know, and same for the council for, for your for your workspace. Um, and, that, and when we all do that, um, we're very hopeful that we can continue to uh, further reopen the city. Deputy Commissioner, do you find it a were you, were you surprised and the Department of Health surprised that the numbers based on all the demonstrations that we had in New York City, uh, did the numbers continue to go down? Is that because people who are demonstrating, and, and this is not a total based on what I see in TV, uh, many are wearing masks. Uh, is, do, do you, did you, was that a surprise to you? And the reason I'm asking is many of them are the ones who are going to be coming back on phase two. And, and by the way, I, I made an assumption that two weeks will be a Monday. So every two weeks, you know, normally that's how. And so I, I don't have any uh, inside information, but just based um, on what I've seen in other counties. Uh, but did you find it strange that the numbers continue to go down? Um, so thank you for that clarification on phase two. I do want people to, you know, we, we want to make sure that New Yorkers know that we are in phase one and we do not have a date um, for phase two. So we, we should continue to follow the phase one practices. Wow. Um, you know, I will, I will, um, I will have to uh, defer to my uh, epidemiologist colleagues about whether they are surprised. I can tell you that we are following, um, we're following very closely uh, what's happening um, in the data. Um, so that we are, we can um, make sure that the, the risk reduction measures are calibrated to what we're seeing in terms of uh, the health of New Yorkers and the spread of, um, of, of COVID-19. So again, we can all, you know, work together, continue to practice the core four, and hope to further reopen New York City. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioners. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Very valuable. I'm looking forward uh, to uh, an ongoing uh, dialogue with uh, uh, yourselves 
and the majority leader uh, to come up with a good consensus. I think at the end of the day, we want the same thing. It's just the how to usually is where uh, usually uh, uh, we struggle with at, at times. And so, but we all had the best of intention. And again, I applaud you all. I know you've been working overtime, seven days a week uh, for the last hundred and something days. And so I salute you all as long uh, as well as my colleagues who are here present. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll turn it now to public test to the moderator for public testimony. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Before we go to public testimony, I see Majority Leader Cumbo has her hand up. Um, Majority Leader Cumbo, would you like to ask additional questions? Just one additional question. Um, have there been thoughts about um, reworking what we understand as paid uh, sick time or how we're going to be in the restart phasing looking at sick time? Because um, when we're typically pre-COVID, if I felt sick, I would still come to work and I would still come to work for however many days that I possibly could until I'm one of those people that I'm either at work or I'm in the hospital. So now it's one of those things where if you have a sniffle or a cough, you should stay home. Um, and if you're feeling sick or if someone came to work, they tested positive for COVID-19 and those that work in their space would then have to be incubated has there been, uh, quarantined rather, it, have there been thoughts given to how we're going to relook at sick time um, now that we're encouraging people for so much as a sniffle and those sniffles can also translate to their children having a cold um, or other things. How, are we looking at how we pay people and paid sick time um, in all of this? So at the start of the health emergency, the city, we released updated time and leave guidance. Uh, okay. And uh, for anyone who is tested positive or has uh, some of the symptoms, uh, we have given excused leave that would not count towards or against uh, a leave balance. So we have looked at that in order to encourage people that if they're not feeling well to stay home, because that's part of the core four. If you're not feeling well, stay home, do not come to work. Uh, so there has been um, in the during this during this time uh, an acknowledgement and um, action taken to make sure that we're encouraging people to stay home. And if you're and if you're um, if you if you're COVID positive and you need more than two weeks, you take and you you get the excused leave until you you recover. So I think that that has definitely been um, a move that we've made in specifically to address that point. And is this moving forward going to be something that people are going to have to get tested for in order to demonstrate that they have had, that they have COVID-19? I think if you, it's not a requirement, uh, but mm -hmm. you do need medical documentation that you, that you have the symptoms uh, in order to obtain the excused leave, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but if you do have a positive diagnosis, then that that obviously would, would uh, count. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the Sergeant at Arms will set a timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to call on Joshua Barnett to testify. After Joshua Barnett, I will be calling on Kevin Bogle and then John Forster. Joshua Barnett, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Okay, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody and really thank you. This is a vital issue. Um, I'm sending in my testimony. 
My name is Joshua Barnett. I work for the Housing Authority as an architect. I've been there since 1999. I'm also a member of Local 375 DC 37, asking where I'm a shop steward. And like many of my coworkers around the city, I've been working remotely since the middle of March. We've heard that we're due to go back to the office sometime in June or July, but we have no firm schedule. And what concerns myself and a lot of my coworkers is that we not be returned prematurely and that be a plan in place to make sure that we go back to a safe environment. We know that the curve here is not flattened and we're looking at a second and third and possibly fourth wave in the future. We had issues with sanitation at our workplace at Long Island City even before the pandemic. We've had to file grievances for basic um, health and safety issues, but now things like hand sanitizers, paper towels, hot, um, hot water um, are not just a matter of basic workplace health, it's a matter of life and death. We also, as NYCHA workers, monitor construction projects at housing developments around the city. And we need to know that as construction professionals, as construction is reinvigorated, that proper safety measures be taken. This is especially vital since we interact with the residents of public housing. who have had a very difficult time during the pandemic, over a thousand fatalities so far. Um, and the conditions of public housing due to years of underfunding and understaffing have made it even worse and it's very difficult to practice social distancing. We have at the Housing Authority, getting back to the union question, have the unions have been in constant contact with each other and both the field workers and central office workers share these same concerns about PPE, social distancing, transportation, daycare, um, that our offices be decleaned. We just moved back to an office with an open office landscape. This is not conducive to health now. We wanna know what modifications are gonna be made before we go back. And we're also concerned about just our job security in general. Um, as tax revenue goes down, there's been a lot of outsourcing and privatization at the Housing Authority, and we don't want to see our numbers go down. The Housing Authority has hired people to maintain the developments from a health point of view during the pandemic, but it's been very unsuccessful with a lot of complaints. Um, we have attached our I'm list sorry. of demands. Okay that we've sent to housing authorities. So we support this bill. We need to have an ongoing dialogue and we wanna make sure that we're part of, the, we have a part of the discussion. Thank you. Unless there are any questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. I would now like to welcome Kevin Bogle to testify. After Kevin Bogle, I will be calling on John Forster and then Elizabeth Eastman. Kevin Bogle, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you for the time and opportunity to testify today. My name is Kevin Bogle. I am an assistant landscape architect at New York City Parks Capital Projects. I also serve as the secretary for our chapter of DC 37 Local 375, and it is in this capacity I am testifying today on behalf of Chapter 7. As a chapter, we wish to share our support of Majority Leader Cumbo's proposed law to ensure the health, safety, and well being of the city's workforce. Uh, our chapter's executive board has been meeting to discuss safety concerns with management at parks as well as with OLR in an ongoing manner since late February and early March. Uh, we wish to encourage the continued open communication between uh, the newly formed office and with unions and workers. Uh, there's not going to be a one size fits all solution for every office, for every work site, and for every field office in the city. Uh, and a lot of the rank and file workers and union members have been doing work already to shine a light on what needs to change to keep our, uh, our workers safe. Um, for example, in chapter seven, we have three proposals. Uh, teleworking has been uh, working beyond our wildest dreams when we went into it. Uh, and this isn't just workers at Fieldist, we've heard the same from management. For those city workers who are successfully working from home, we hope that we can continue this as long as possible uh, for the safety of ourselves, our families, and our communities. Uh, for example, the city of San Francisco has recently decided that city workers will work from home until July of 2021. Uh, I can submit this letter as evidence, uh, as an exhibit if needed. Uh, second, we'd like to propose that city fleet vehicle fleet centralization mandate be postponed until post-COVID. Right now we have resident engineers sharing vehicles sometimes in the same day um, because of this uh, DCAS proposal to consolidate. And while normally we would support such a thing at this time, it may result in cross-contamination and COVID exposure. And finally, for those working on construction sites and field offices or those who cannot work from home, we encourage following scientifically sound methods to ensure uh, temperature checks, plentiful PPE, fully sanitized facilities, and hand sanitizer uh, as uh, necessary elements for worker safety 
Thank you for your time and attention and concern for the well-being of civil servants. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from from Majority Leader Kamba. Majority Leader Kamba, you may begin. Briefly to both Kevin and Joshua, I thank you both for your testimonies. I, I just wanted to know if the best practices that you're talking about, do you feel that there has been city administration overarching that's been giving you guidance in terms of what reopening should look like? Or do you feel that within your specific agencies, you all are working in a very insular way to create how you think your agency should work best um, and how to move forward? Or do you feel like you're getting guidance? And do you feel like there's a space and a place for you to put forward many of the recommendations, other than this hearing, of course, which is fantastic, but do you feel like there are there's a space for you to say and not just a safety space, but like a receiving place for the ideas that you're discussing. Kevin, you can begin. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, I would say that my experience uh, in Chapter 7 has been uh, one of gathering information from workers as to uh, what they believe the holes in the safety are at the moment, a lack of PPE, hand sanitizer, or so on. And then having regular meetings with management and OLR to kind of relay those uh, concerns up the chain of command. Um, I've experienced very little kind of citywide um, uh, communication, um, either from a commissioner or a mayoral level. Um, it's been very ground up in my experience. I thank you for that because as you're speaking, it's making me feel like our employees, our staff, those in our offices, like what this process should look like should almost come from the ground up in terms of let the agencies um, and their staff from maintenance and security to agency heads and commissioners, like putting forth together, like really hearing from people what they think should drive this reopening and how it should look because there are things that I'm going to see that the person who maintains the building is not going to see and vice versa. So I, um, I thank you for that. And I thank you for sharing those ideas. We're definitely going to document those um, and share them as well. Thank you. Joshua. I would definitely, I would definitely have to um, second what Kevin just said that not only haven't we seen anything overarching from the city, but even within the housing authority, which is a very large um, mm -hmm. organization, 12,000 workers difference between operations and maintenance. But even so, you know, again, having the unions in contact with each other, we've been getting different feedback from people in the field, people at the central office, people in different central offices. Um, the housing authority, they've done a great job in terms of helping us work remotely. Like he said, you know, this IT has been incredible. We have all the software, things are ongoing. Um, and whether it's your cup of tea or not to work at home, it has been really facilitated. Um, and so we've been able to deliver services to the residents, but in terms of having a dialogue or soliciting input, that we haven't seen we've reached out to management um but we haven't really had a lot of response and so we're still waiting for that to happen i know one of the greatest challenges that i hear from my nitro residents is um services so yeah. everything from a leaky roof to uh, a bathroom toilet that doesn't flush yeah. were many of those issues able to be addressed during covid um that's not specifically what I deal with, but from what I've heard from our communities, for instance, local 237, um, it's been, you know, they've had to do a lot of triage um, mm -hmm. and there was a lot, a lot, a lot of difficulties, as you know, um, alleviating the backlog of operations repairs even before this. And so this is, right. only really, this is really only made it more difficult and we really had to do the bare bones cleaning and repairs. Um, and so it's basically kind of made the worst of it. From what I hear from them, it's kind of made the worst of a bad situation. Like what Kevin said, and this is my last question, I'm just so intrigued by this. Has any elements of working at home improved the operations of NYCHA from your vantage point? Has working from home improved services, implementation, response times, ability to get things done in a way that couldn't beforehand? 
from my point of view, um, I work in the design department. We work in capital projects. Um, so from, from what I've seen um, and from what I've heard also from the operations, we've been able to keep up speed on a lot of things. I haven't heard that it's actually improved anything. Like when we come up with a capital project, we have to have a dialogue with the stakeholders whose spaces we're gonna be renovating. You know, it really helps to have a face-to-face -face conversation in those situations. And that's become more difficult in terms of the actual repairs that you're talking about. Like I said, it's kind of been an uphill battle from what I'm hearing. Well, I got a few parts I'd love for you to design before we leave okay. out of here. So. Anytime. More, more more discussions later. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Majority Leader. I would now like to welcome John Forster to testify. After John Forster, I will be calling on Elizabeth Eastman. Uh, John Forster, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Time starts now. Good afternoon, um, members of the council and members of the audience. Um, my name is John Forster. I work with Local 375, I'm also the co-chair at the District Council 37 of our Climate and Justice Committee. Uh, we as Local 375 represent about 5,500 architects, engineers, project managers that work as authorities such as the New York City Housing Authority. Uh, this has been a very difficult time for a lot of our members. It's uh, particularly in terms of getting PPE. Uh, it, it often um, took weeks and in some cases even months to get PPE to staff, including some of our staff that remained in the field throughout this time period. Um, however, we have worked hard now um, with various locals in DC 37, with CWA 1180, with OSA, uh, and with other unions, especially at NYCHA, but not only at NYCHA, um, to develop uh, a series of what we think are a short list of protocols that are absolutely essential. Um, these we shared actually with Council Member Rosenthal when she did her town hall uh, in regards to NYCHA, and we're actually sending that very list to many of you right now um, and hope that it will be looked at. Um, we're deeply concerned, I think, about the timing uh, on phase two, um, I, I, it sounds like to me, if we're talking Monday, that we're really not ready to do that in a situation that has tremendous impact on the health and very lives of our members that would have to go back to work um, in the offices. Uh, we believe that intro 1950 is actually a really good idea. I think it's essential that we have uh, a, a centralized place and a review of the at least the, the shortlist protocols um, and, and therefore, I think it would be very helpful. Um, and I also believe that where we can continue to have our staff work remotely, they should. I think it's to everybody's benefit to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, unless there are any questions from the members, we will move to the next panelist. I would now like to welcome Elizabeth Eastman to testify. Elizabeth Eastman, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this important issue. My name is Liz Easton and I'm a city worker with HPD and a local 375 member. In mid-March, my colleagues and I began to work from home due to the health crisis created by COVID-19. As of today, we're still working from home. As the city reopens, my colleagues and I have heard mixed messages regarding our return to work. We have heard that there are some work units in HPD that are scheduled to return to the building within the next weeks and days and weeks. We've also heard that the NC has already asked some of our about a clear, concise plan to protect the safety of workers in the building. Most of us are familiar with the guidelines from the CDC. And while we are aware that those guidelines have been changing as more as more is learned about COVID-19, what we know is that the offices that we left behind in March are for the most part ill-equipped to keep the workers safe from the virus. Some of the concerns that we have were about testing and whether employees would be tested before they returned to work and whether it was subject to temperature checks upon arrival at the office each morning. We were also concerned about our colleagues, excuse me, who were afraid to return to work. Perhaps they have an underlying condition or a family member who is at risk should they contract the virus. How will these workers be protected? This virus has serious ramifications for people with a variety of conditions. 
and their health and the health of their loved ones. Many of the employees who are working for HPD on 9-11 have found themselves with health conditions caused by exposure to toxins that were in the air in the weeks and months after the towers fell. Those workers who I'm referring to were not directly involved in the recovery efforts. These workers got sick simply by coming into Lower Manhattan and into their office building. These workers came to work because they were told their work environment was safe. Years later, they have found that it is not safe and they have paid a steep price with their health due to this misinformation. I am one of those workers. COVID-19 is a new health crisis and the city must avoid making the same mistakes with the health of its workers that it did after 9-11. There needs to be a comprehensive plan to address the safety of all city workers and a strategy to bring workers back to their jobs safely and that plan must involve the dialogue across all agencies and must take into consideration the guidelines set forth by the CDC. As such, I stand in support of this bill, Intro 1950. This bill is a strong step in protecting the workers of the city. And I thank the city council for taking action on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from Majority Leader Kumpa. I want to thank you, Ms. Eastman, for your testimony. Everything that you outlined is really the inspiration for this legislation. Um, hearing much of the testimony today, I do not believe that the city is ready to move forward with phase two. There are so many questions, just like the ones that you outlined in terms of how do we protect our seniors with pre-existing health conditions returned back to work? How do we create a healthy work environment where everyone coming into the work environment knows um, exactly what they need to do to handle every type of health precaution that they might have. And I, I think you're exactly right. Um, this is going to take more time. It's important that we not rush it. I would say, you know, decades after 9-11 has happened, as you stated, we are still facing so many health issues that people have uh, faced ever since that particular Going to rush something because we've seen on so many levels that COVID-19, it's not for many people just something that clears from your system, that many people in other countries have described that their lung capacity never quite returned back to what it was um, prior to COVID-19. So we have to take our workforce very seriously in protecting them. This is one of a dozen steps that need to be in, in terms of proper protocols and precautions to make sure that we don't have a phase two um, of COVID-19 because a phase two would really devastate the city in a way that would be very difficult for us to rebound from. So thank you so much, Ms. Eastman. Thank you so much for your testimony. And um, I stand with you in terms of making this even stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Kumbo. Thank you, Majority Leader Kumbo. At this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you so much, uh, CJ Murray. Fabulous job in moderating. I wanna thank every single one of the staff. You are amazing. Nobody does it better than you. I wanna thank uh, every single one of our panelists uh, that came in uh, and share. I just wanna let you know, we take it to heart uh, and there will be follow up. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the commissioners as, as well. Uh, and I want to thank in particular Majority Leader Combo for her bill. Uh, I know that this is important to her because it's important to our people, our constituents. Uh, we have, uh, we, we've been through some of the worst of our days and we don't want to repeat. We don't want to have a part two of this. That's my greatest fear. It's a second wave. 
And we got to get this right. We got to do it right. And we have to streamline how we're going to coordinate and, and get to the finish line. Um, so uh, Majority Leader Combo, thank you. I salute you uh, for always caring and always being so kind about it and courageous. Uh, and, and my colleagues as well, thank you uh, for being here today. And with that, with my cell phone, three times, we close today's meeting. Thank you so much. God bless.